we're now should be aware uh, that the evidence that you're going to be seeing in your cases uh, is involving blogs, it's involving social media, uh, and, and all that could support either your client's defenses or, or it could support the government's prosecution of your matter. And, and, and so you all, as criminal defense practitioners, have seen the ominous whiteboard uh, that the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office is able to pull out uh, as a trial uh, demonstrative exhibit uh, presentation system and, and you're left with no whiteboard. And, and so how are you going to tackle the government being able to display uh, for the jury to see in very large format all the questionable social media content that your client may have uh, been engaged in? Uh, if that's not uh, enough of a worry for you, it's the digital devising, uh, devices that record information now and, and they come from numerous settings. Uh, so we have not only voice recognition and, 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 uh, and messages there, we have cell phones. Uh, we have all this information now being collected uh, through our cell phones, even when you're not talking on your cell phone. And, and so your information is constantly being pinged uh, to different transmitters throughout the uh, area. And so now they can pretty much track exactly where you're going, how long it took you to get there. Uh, if they're tracking the cell phone conversations, they know who you were talking with how long those conversations took place. And, and so they're intercepting the content of those communications. They know what your client was thinking. Uh, if there's photographic evidence at issue from digital cameras, they know the creation date of all that. They know the last modification. Uh, they know the access uh, information and GPS coordinates of when uh, the, all that documents or, or, or digital uh, photos uh, were taken. So all this can potentially implicate uh, your client's uh, actions, identity, motive, and, and perhaps engagement in a conspiracy. Uh, and so uh, we're left now even with uh, additional problems uh, for, for the criminal defense uh, to face. Uh, we have now cameras recording locations at virtually uh, any number of, of sources, uh, primarily uh, not even from government sources. We have a, the private industry and big box uh, retailers uh, capturing just about everything nowadays, and that information could potentially be given to the government. Uh, we have the capture of license plates normally at our point of entries, uh, and so we have GPS devices, chips, uh, and sensors at all those locations. Every time your client is passing by a toll uh, collection station, uses OnStar, uh, uses his passport, all that's tracking uh, the whereabouts uh, of your client. And so what duties now do you all as criminal practitioners primarily, and I see a number of people from the, assistant, uh, from the U.S. Attorney's Office here, I'll be devoting most of my remarks here to criminal defense attorneys, but it, it, it applies equally to both sides here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about just what now uh, the ABA is doing in terms of what your ethical responsibilities are. Ron, you want to tackle that? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Talking about the ABA, the ABA created a commission 2020 a couple of years ago to try to look at how ethical obligations of attorneys may be changing or may be reformulated because of ESI, electronically stored information. That led to two sets of amendments, well, a number of amendments that went into effect in 2012 when they were approved by the House of Delegates. 1.1 is the basic competence rule the amendments in 2012 changed a comment. And the comment is the next slide, if we could. And that really just says, watch what's going on in the world of technology. It's very general. It's talking about risks and benefits and the like. From your point of view, when you are representing defendants in criminal proceedings, the immediate question that would come to me in that context is effective assistance of counsel. We've had at least one decision. There was a decision from the Missouri Supreme Court a couple of years ago reversing a conviction because of ineffective assistance of counsel because the counsel did not do internet research on veneermen for a jury. So there's a practical aspect of knowing about technology and knowing what you can do. Uh, you can Google a lot of people and find out a lot of information about p people, including potential jurors. There are ethical implications go of that. We won't go into that today. We'll leave that for another time. But that's one of the amendments that went into effect that talk about technology. The issue, of course, is going to be 
how does this obligation you have under this comment in 1.1 <laughs> translate into your obligation to defend your clients? A terabyte, if you were to print that out, it would take 29 semi-trucks to carry it. Okay, so when you're dealing with digital evidence, electronic evidence, it's astounding how much data is there. So that's one terabyte, which most hard drives now have more than that. So 29 semi-trucks, 638 million pages, something to that effect. Um, it's, it's very easy today. There, there's no real requirement to hang out a shingle and say I'm an expert. So I, I would say that something else that's astounding is the amount of digging that has to be done, particularly as it relates to some of the smaller devices that we were referred to earlier, the GPS, the phones, the things that contain flash memory. <clears throat> The reason for that is um, applications. So 15,000 applications roughly are released every day. Uh, being able to write the code to extract that kind of data and keep up with it, the tool manufacturers, is a crazy job. It's very difficult to do. So if you have someone who says, I have this tool, that's all I need, you need to run from them. And if you have someone who says, I have 12 tools and I run 12 tools on every device I get, you need to run from them too because they're just charging you by the hour and you don't need 12 tools. But that's not to say that you shouldn't be looking for data from multiple sources when it comes to digital evidence because the tools are going to miss stuff. They do every time and it's because of the code. So it validates and it verifies what you're getting uh, and it, ha it has to be done. In the lab that I used to run, it was a minimum of two tools per, per device. Uh, again, that was to help cover ourselves but it was also a way to validate and verify the findings um, just because the data changes so fast. And again, with, with information, the Internet of Things and some of the other things that are, are coming up and being controlled, there's so much collision uh, issues, data collision, um, that it, it requires a lot of digging. I think uh, when it comes to um, data from a, uh, a provider, you know, Facebook, that kind of thing, is totally different from what you're getting from devices. And when it comes from computers, um, the tools are more robust. When it comes from something, like I said, with mobile devices or whatever, it's flash memory, uh, they're not. And I, I don't think they ever will be just because of the changes, the applications, and the type of memory that it is, because it's, it's totally different from a spinning hard drive. Well, let me start with what I think is perhaps the easiest case, is when there's a grand jury subpoena issued to a corporation or a corporate official. In that context, the obligation to preserve uh, potentially relevant information obviously accrues. And that, that's an easy one. I think we all understand that. But one question that tends to come up or one issue that tends to come up in these cases is what happens if a subpoena is not yet issued? Is there still an obligation to preserve documents? And you know, each case is going to be different. It's going to depend on the facts and circumstances of the case. But there are certainly situations where the obligation to preserve accrues before a subpoena is issued. Um, and my main point here is that as, as, as counsel, you really want to err on the side of caution in these areas and preserve. Um, you know, to give you an example of a situation that may be an obligation to preserve a cruise uh, before subpoena is issued, as corporate counsel, you, you are probably familiar with this situation where a corporation may you know, come across fraud or embezzlement by a corporate official. And so what they do in the first instance is potentially go out and retain outside counsel or even their inside counsel to do an internal investigation. And as part of that investigation, they may uncover this embezzlement and come to the government with a packet and say, hey, here's all this information that we've been able to find. And in those scenarios, the last thing you want is to provide a package of information to the government and then find out that a lot of that information has been subsequently deleted because you didn't provide a hold notice or you didn't preserve the documents that were part of that investigation. And so just from a practical perspective, you know, a couple of things that, that tend to trip folks up is auto deletion policies. A lot of corporations have them. They're part of the legitimate business process. They're in the ordinary course. But when you're doing an investigation, that's something that you want to understand. You know, where are those auto deletion policies? Does it make sense to stop them for, you know, a particular period for particular custodians and individuals? Um, so that's one that I, I think tends to trip up a lot of folks. The second piece is backup. Um, there are many times where corporations have just backup policies where, you know, after 30 days they're going to overwrite the servers because they don't need it. It's really for disaster recovery. But again, sometimes there's an obligation to preserve that type of information and you don't want a situation 
to have happen where that information gets overwritten by accident. Um, and the third just sort of practical piece of advice I'd, I'd give on this is um, in the civil context, especially if you're with a larger firm and you have a relationship with some of these corporations, uh, it tends to be that the folks on the civil side, uh, if you're in a law firm or even in-house, have a much better understanding of some of the IT issues and servers and where documents are kept because they see it over and over in, in civil contexts. And as somebody who focuses mainly on criminal practice, you might not have that same type of relationship with the corporation. So sometimes some things that are, are helpful is talking with co-counsel who may actually know a lot of the information where it resides in the, in the company so that you're not uh, blindsided by some of these auto-deletion and backup policies.